أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين أما بعد سلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته <coughs> Last night we looked at an important quality of the daughter of the Holy Prophet and we said that one of her names is At-Tahirah one who has the state of Tahara we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept her away from all types of impurities and then we started to explore the concept of Tahara within Islam we say that you could say that the spiritual journey in Islam is a journey of purification and there are many stages of purification and each stage of purification is important. One of the points that we made last night is that the purpose of the external tahara is to bring about internal purification. <clears throat> we wash our bodies, we wash our clothes, we clean our surroundings so that somehow it inspires and motivates us to purify our hearts as well. And we say that the condition for this is a moment of reflection, a moment of contemplation. One of the best examples that we have of this is when Shibli goes for Hajj. And after he comes back from Hajj, <coughs> the fourth Imam, Imam al-Sajjad alayhi afdalu salati was salam He starts to ask him certain questions. And he says, O oh Shibli, when you went for the Miqat, did you make the intention that you are taking off the garment of disobedience and you're putting on the garment of obedience? Did you have that moment of reflection? Did you think about that? And Shibli said, No. The Imam said to him, O oh Shibli, when you took off your clothes which were sewn, did you also make the intention that you are taking off hypocrisy? You are taking off showing off. You're taking off the idea of intruding into suspicious things. And Shibli said, no. Then the Imam says to him, O oh Shibli, when you performed your ghusl, did you contemplate even for a moment <clears throat> that you're washing away your sins and your acts of disobedience? And Shibli said, no. And the Imam said to him, therefore, you didn't go to the Miqat, you didn't take off your sewn clothes, and you did not perform the ghusl. So the condition is to engage in an act of reflection. <clears throat> now this evening, I want to continue in a similar fashion. I want to talk about those things that we do in everyday life. Before you stand up for prayer, you make sure your clothes are pure, you make sure your body is pure. You purify your clothes, you purify your body as well. And I want to look at what are some acts of reflection that we can engage in to elevate those actions, to bring about spiritual purity. So the Prophet of Allah tells us that when you stand up for the prayer, your clothes have to be tahir. And you have to make them tahir if they are not pure. And the Prophet of Allah also tells us that when you stand up for prayer, your clothes should be clean. They should not be dirty. And the Prophet of Allah says in a hadith, Man ittakhada thawban fal yunadhifhu. In fact, anyone who takes a piece of clothing, then he should clean it. Okay? Some of the scholars have said that one of the reasons 
for why the Prophet of Allah has recommended the believers to wear white clothes. There are many reasons for it. One of the reasons why the Prophet of Allah has recommended that we wear white is because white clothes, when they become dirty, it becomes very obvious. Okay? It stands out. So that when it becomes dirty, you were to clean it. Then in the hadith we're told <coughs> that the clothes that you wear also have an impact on your mind and your thinking as well. The first Imam, Amirul Mu'mineen, alayhi afdalu salati was salam. Says, an nadifu min athiyab yudhibu al-hamma wal-huzna. When you wear clean clothes, when you wear clothes which are tahir, it takes away your sorrow, it takes away your worries, it takes away your grief as well. Then you find that the Ahlul Bayt السلام, would wear the best of their clothes and the cleanest of their clothes in two places in particular. And they would emphasize wearing it on those two places in particular. The first one is when for men, they would wear the best of their clothes when they would come to the, to the masjid, when they would stand up in prayer. And for men and women, they would wear the cleanest of their clothes when they would come to the masjid. Two. The second place where the Ahlul Bayt emphasized that we need to wear the cleanest of our clothes and the best of our clothes is in the, in the house, in the home. We normally forget to do that. For some reason, when we go home, we lower our standards. Yes. One of the companions of the fifth Imam, he says that one day I entered to see the fifth Imam. I saw him wearing good clothes. The clothes were so good. The beard was made so well. The hair dye was put on it so well. There was kohal put into the eyes that even I in my heart started to become a little bit doubtful and suspicious about the Imam. No. And the Imam saw that on my face. And he invited me the next day. And he said to me, oh so and so, I wear good clothes in the house for my wife. Because, I'm narrating for you the hadith of the Imam. Because she wears good clothes for me, and she likes me to do the same for her as well. This is the sunnah and the seerah of the Ahlul Bayt. Two places in particular, one in the masjid and the second one in the house. <clears throat> then it was in the sunnah of the Holy Prophet. Not only would he wear the cleanest of his clothes, but he would look presentable. His body was clean as well. It was very presentable when he came out in public. And therefore he had certain practices, certain sunan that he would perform on the day of Friday. In one hadith we are told, وَعَلَيْكُمْ بِسُنَنِ يَوْمَ الْجُمْعَةِ And observe the practices of the day of Friday. وَهِيَ سَبْعَةِ And they are seven. Okay. Amongst them, the hadith says, وَغَسْلُ الرَّأْسِ وَالْلِحْيَ بِالْخَطْمِ To wash the head and to wash the beard with khatmi. Khatmi was a type of flower back then. Think of it as soap. Two, وَأَخْذُ الشَّارِبْ And to trim your moustache. Three, and further, وَتَقْلِيمُ الْأَضَافِيرِ To cut your nails. وَتَغْيِيرُ thiyab To change your clothes and to wear clean clothes. And finally, وَمَسُّ الطِّيبِ And to have a little bit of fragrance on you. Then the Prophet of Allah, when he would put on some of the best of his clothes, and he would look presentable, he had a mirror at the door of his house. Every time he would leave the house, he would look into that mirror. And when he would look into that mirror, he would have a moment of reflection. And his moments of reflection came in the form of, we said last night, his moments of reflection came in the form of dua. Every dua is a moment of reflection. 
every time an imam tells you recite this dua in this place then you should know that there is something that the imam wants you to think about when you are in that place and you will find it in that dua okay listen to the dua of the holy prophet allahumma <clears> kama <throat> ahsanta khalqi fahassin khulqi wa rizqi O oh Allah, the way you have adorned my physique, you have adorned my body, then O oh Allah, I ask you to adorn my character and to give me in my risk as well. Okay? <clears throat> now, <clears throat> as we are growing up, you find that if you have children in the house, <clears throat> there's a particular age where they don't care about the clothes that they wear. Whatever you give them, they're going to wear. Whatever you buy for them, they're going to wear. They'll allow you to buy their clothes for them. <clears throat> and even when they're being picky about their clothes, if you pay a little bit of attention to it when they're five, six, seven years of age, normally it's because they like that piece of cloth. They like the color, they like the design, they've got some attachment to it. And as a parent, <clears throat> you can argue with them. And you'll tell them, Baba, it doesn't look good. It's not appropriate for that gathering. It's not clean. It's dirty. But the child will say, but that's the piece of cloth that I want to wear. That's the dress that I want to wear. And then they grow up. And they come to a particular age where they reach the age of bulugh, or close to puberty. And they start experiencing certain changes. You will notice changes in their behavior. You'll notice changes in their cognitive abilities. You'll notice changes in their emotions as well. Some of the most important changes that happen are in their psychology, the way they think. We don't pay attention to it as parents. But if you understand it, you can understand a lot of their behavior. For example, as the child goes through puberty, one of the things the child begins to appreciate is his sense of independence and his autonomy. And so he's trying to exercise his autonomy sometimes. One of the things that the child comes to appreciate as he's growing up is that people are observing my clothes. They're observing my behavior. They're observing my speech. And he also comes to realize that people are judging him on the basis of his clothes, on the basis of his behavior, <clears throat> on the basis of his speech, on the basis of his hair and how he makes his hair. Right? And suddenly you notice that the child becomes very possessive about which clothes he wears, doesn't allow you to pick his clothes for him brother in the community once came to me and said, I don't know what's happened to my child. He's just in grade seven. Last year it wasn't a problem, but this year every day in the morning, he spends 30 minutes making his hair. Right? <clears throat> Why? Because he knows that there's an image that he has to carry in his society. And people are going to judge him on the basis of his clothes. Sahih? If he wears these clothes, people will think he's smart. If he wears them in this manner, they'll think he's important. If he wears this brand, people will think he's cool. Right? A child understands that. Okay? <clears throat> as we understand that and we grow up, we bring that into our adulthood as well. Every time you put on clothes, every time you go to buy certain clothes, at the back of your mind, you've always got this, that I have a particular image to protect in the society. You're always asking yourself, if I wear this, what will people think of me? If I wear this, how are people going to judge me? If I speak in this manner, how are people going to perceive me? Right? And so we try and buy the best of clothes. And we make sure that our clothes are clean and they're not dirty because we don't want people to think that we're dirty. 
Yes? And we'll buy fashionable clothes. If they're changing every season, we'll change with it as well because we don't want people to think that we are old-fashioned. Yes? And we'll buy brand name clothes as well to the extent that we'll take loans sometimes to be able to buy clothes and we can't put them on the credit card because we've already maxed out the credit cards, right? Because we want to hold a particular image in the society. There's a particular standard. People are judging us and that is constantly worrying us. If you think about it, a lot of our decision making is also based on that. Not just clothes, but the way we talk, the way we interact with people, the house that we choose to buy, the car that we drive. We're always thinking, how is this reflecting my image in the society? Now, Islam does not prohibit us from wearing good clothes. If a person can afford it in moderation, Islam encourages that, yes? One day a person saw the sixth holy Imam, Imam al-Sadiq alayhi afdalu salati was salam. And the Imam was wearing good clothes, presentable clothes. And he comes to the Imam and he says, I knew your father and I also knew your grandfather. And I was looking for the successor to your father. And they told me it was you. But when I see you wearing these clothes, Astaghfirullah. You are not the right successor to your father. Na'udhu Billah. The Imam responded to him and listened to the response. The Imam says, Woe be unto you, Man harrama zinatallahi lati akhraja li ibadi wa tayyibati minar risq. Who has made haram? The beauty that, this is a verse of the Qur'an. Who has made haram the beauty that God has brought forth for his servants and the wholesome risk that he has provided them? If it is not meant for the believers, then for whom did God create this beauty? Then the Imam says to him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he blesses a servant of his, then he likes to see that blessing on him. He likes to see that servant using that blessing. Okay? So Islam has not prohibited this. Now here's the main point and the point of reflection. Yeah? When the Ahlul Bayt used to put on clothes, they were also very conscious. And they were also very concerned. The second holy Imam one day had put on the best of his clothes. It was the time for Salat and he was going to the masjid. You'll find this hadith when you go in the Quran, there's a verse in the Quran where God says, Ya Bani Adama, O children of Adam, Khudu zinatakum inda kulli masjid. Take your beauty and adornment to every place of prayer. When you look in the tafsir of that verse, you will find this particular hadith. The Imam was wearing the best of his clothes to the masjid. Somebody asked him, Yabna Rasulillah, why do you wear the best of your clothes to the masjid? The Imam said, He said, Inna Allah Jameel, God is beautiful. Yuhibbul Jamal loves beauty. And the last part, and the most important part, Wa atajamalu li Rabbi. And I am adorning myself for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? <coughs> Sometimes you wear clothes and you wonder, will my family think I look beautiful? Will my friends think I look good? Will the society think I look presentable? When the Ahlul Bayt used to put on clothes, the first question they would ask, does God think I look beautiful? Okay. Even if they are the simplest of clothes, but if he thinks I look beautiful, that's more important. Their first haya was in the presence of God. When we think of wearing certain clothes, we feel embarrassed because we know that people are watching us. Yes. 
when they thought of embarrassment, the first person that came to mind was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Being embarrassed in the presence of God. Being embarrassed in the status of God, right? That you are in the presence of such a great being, right? Let me share with you a couple of ahadith of how the Ahlul Bayt looked at the concept of Haya and how we look at the concept of Haya. You say to yourself sometimes, I can't wear these clothes because I feel Haya in public. What will people think of me? The Ahlul Bayt alayhim as -salam. In one hadith in the wasi of Imam Al-Kadhim alayhi as -salam, <laughs> He says to Hisham, فَاسْتَحْيُوا مِنَ اللَّهِ فِي سَرَائِرِكُمْ كَمَا تَسْتَحْيُونَ مِنَ النَّاسِ فِي عَلَانِيَتِكُمْ Have haya in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In your privacy, the same way you have haya in front of people in public. Somebody came to the Holy Prophet and said, عِذْنِي يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ O Prophet of God, give me an advice that's beneficial for me. So the Prophet says to this person, he says to him, Istahi min Allahi ta'ala, istihya'uka min dhawil haybati min qawmik. All I ask from you is that you be embarrassed and you have haya in the presence of God the way you have haya in the presence of a dignified person in your community. Don't you carry yourself differently? Don't you talk differently? Don't you behave differently? Even when you're not afraid that he's going to punish you, but because he has a gravity and a dignity to him, you act differently. The Prophet says, all I ask you is that every moment of your life, you have the same haya in the presence of God. Right? Therefore, you find the Ahlul Bayt السلام, had haya in places where sometimes we don't have haya. And they were not embarrassed in certain places where we would be embarrassed. Okay? Look at the example of Lady Fatima on her wedding night. When somebody came and knocked at her door and said, I need something to wear. And she had two pieces of clothing. One was the best of her clothing meant for the wedding night. And one was a simple piece of clothing. Many of us would feel haya to wear that simple piece of clothing because we're very concerned about how people are going to judge us. She felt haya to wear the best piece of clothing because she was concerned about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to judge her. Right? We change our clothes. We sometimes also have to change our thinking as well. When we take off our clothes, we also have to take off a little bit of our thinking as well. The wrong thinking. When you talk about wearing pure clothes, it's not just about the purity of the clothes. My brothers and sisters, it's also about the purity of your intention. Who are you wearing it for? Why are you wearing it? Who do you want to impress? Can you imagine if we thought differently like that? You would wear the simplest of clothes, but you would be confident. Because you know you have pleased Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You'd have no trouble in wearing hijab, no matter what anybody else says. Because you know it looks beautiful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And you'd wear the cleanest and the best of your clothes, because you're doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. The second part of the reflection is that when you stand up for salat, not only do you make your clothes tahir, you also make your body tahir as well. And you have to make sure that your body is tahir. And then you also have to clean yourself. It's recommended before you do your wudu to wash your hands. It's recommended to rinse your mouth. It's recommended to rinse your nose as well. 
And we know the Prophet of Allah, when he would stand in prayer, he would look presentable in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes we clean our bodies for hygienic reasons. Sometimes we clean our bodies because it gives us a peace of mind. It gives us tranquility and calmness. Sometimes we clean our bodies because it looks presentable and doesn't give a foul smell. Islam says that one of the reasons why you would want to clean your body is because each and every limb that you clean, you want to use it to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From now on, let's make this an intention whenever we're cleaning ourselves. It's going to change the way you look at everything. I'm cleaning my hands because I want to raise it in prayer. I'm cleaning my face because I want to face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes. I'm cleaning my mouth because I want to talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm wiping my feet because I want to walk towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let me explain this with a very simple and mundane example. You know, we look for spirituality in life. And we go places far and wide to look for spirituality. We end up at bookstores, mind, body, and spirit. Pick up a $30 book. You go for these long sessions sometimes looking for spirituality. We go into nature and we meditate for long periods of time looking for spirituality. You know where the spirituality of the Holy Prophet came? You will find the spirituality of the Holy Prophet came from these mundane things that we do in life. He used them to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His spirituality came at the dinner table. His spirituality came before he went to sleep. His spirituality came when he woke up. His spirituality came when he put on new clothes. Because at that moment he would remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes. And his spirituality came when he used to brush his teeth. Islam is not a difficult religion. Islam was never meant to be a burden. Islam is a religion that just makes every simple part of your life more beautiful, more purposeful, more spiritual. Okay? <clears throat> Comes the brushing of the teeth. The Prophet of Allah says in a very beautiful hadith, he says, مَا زَالَ جِبْرَائِيلِ يُوَصِّينِي بِالسِّوَاكِ حَتَّى خِفْتُ أَنْ أُحْفِيَ أَوْ أُدْرِدَ جِبْرَائِيلِ would recommend me so much to brush my teeth until I, the Prophet of Allah, was afraid that my teeth would get worn off or my teeth would get destroyed. Right? The Prophet even used to recommend before every prayer, brush your teeth. And if you don't have a siwak, use your finger. Yes. Yeah. So brush your teeth. Then the Prophet says, now why should I brush my teeth? The dentist will tell you to protect your teeth. It's hygienic to do that. Listen to the Prophet of Allah. نَظِّفُوا أَفْوَاهَكُمْ فَإِنَّهَا طُرُقُ فَإِنَّهَا طُرُقُ الْقُرْآنِ Clean your mouth because with this mouth these are the pathways of reciting the reciting the Qur'an. With this mouth you want to recite the word of God. With this mouth, you want to talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. With this mouth, you want to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the salat, so clean it. Now, Ayatollah Javadi Amuli says, let's do a reflection together on this short hadith of the Prophet. Notice what the Prophet said, and notice even more what the Prophet did not say. The Prophet of Allah did not say, نَظِّفُوا asnanakum." Clean your teeth. What did he say? Nadifu afwahakum. Clean your mouth. What does it mean? It means don't allow anything haram to enter the mouth. Don't allow anything haram to come out from the mouth. Don't eat anything which is haram. Don't eat anything that's acquired from money which is haram. That's the most important one. 
And then secondly, don't eat something which itself is haram. Right? And two, nothing should come out from your mouth which is haram. Don't lie. Don't gossip. Don't slander. Don't swear. Right? Don't say things that hurt a believer. Don't say things that hurt your parents. Why? Because after one hour you want to recite the Quran. The Prophet of Allah is teaching us <clears throat> that every limb of yours has a physical strength and it has a spiritual strength as well. When you use it in the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it develops its spiritual strength. When you use it in the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it weakens its spiritual strength. Let me give you an example now okay. of the impact that it can have in our lives. So when a person is sick, one of the best things that were recommended to recite for that person is what? If you had <coughs> a few moments of dua to make for that person, the one thing you definitely want to recite for that person is what? Suratul Al-Fatiha. There is nothing better than Suratul Al-Fatiha when somebody is sick. I know that in some of our cultures, you would be even afraid to recite Suratul Al-Fatiha for somebody who is sick. But if you go in the Hadith, the best recitation for somebody who is sick, the Prophet of Allah says that Suratul Al-Fatiha is the cure for every pain and sickness. Reciting Surah Al-Fatiha seven times is a cure for every pain and sickness. Sometimes the hadith says recite it 70 times. The hadith of the sixth imam says, even if a person is dead and you recite Surah Al-Fatiha 70 times and he comes back to life, don't be surprised. Just to carry the importance of reciting Surah Al-Fatiha for a person who is, who is sick. One of the names of Surah Al-Fatiha is Ash-Shafi. The thing that gives cure, right? Shifa. The shifa comes in different ways. It's not always a miracle. Sometimes the medicine works for that person. Sometimes the doctor made a wrong prognosis or a wrong diagnosis. Now he's made the right diagnosis. Sometimes the doctor couldn't make a diagnosis. He recited Fatiha for him. The doctor is not able to make the diagnosis for this person. Naitullah Jawadi asks, how come the Prophet of Allah recites Surah Al-Fatiha once, a person is cured. You recite Surah Al-Fatiha 70 times, that person is not cured. Because the tongue of the Holy Prophet is pure, it is tahir, and we have not made our tongues tahir. We have weakened the spiritual strength of our tongue. At some point in our lives, <coughs> everybody has to make a decision. We have to make a decision on whether our limbs are going to be a tool of Rahman or they are going to be a tool of Shaitan. <coughs> if you're going to dedicate your limb, your tongue, your ear, your eyes, your hands to Rahman, it will not enjoy doing the work of shaitan. If you dedicate your limbs to shaitan, it is not going to enjoy doing the work of Rahman. One simple example. Okay. So we're told to keep our ears pure, keep them clean. It means don't allow haram to enter your ears. Do not allow gossiping to enter your ear or backbiting to enter your ear. You hear somebody backbiting, tell them to stop. If they don't stop, you stand up from that place and you walk away. You don't allow haram music to enter the ear. Okay? If it's being played in some place, you walk away from it. Why? Some of our scholars say that one of the things we're told is that in Jannah, when you go to Jannah, right? The one who is going to be the Qari of Jannah, the one who will be the reciter in Jannah is Prophet Dawood. And if you want to enjoy the recitation of Dawood in Jannah, 
and you want to enjoy the sounds of Jannah, then you have to protect your ear and its spiritual strength in this world. If you use it for things which are haram, then when you go to Jannah, you will not have the capacity to appreciate the recitation of Dawood. Let me tell you what this means. Okay? You don't have to go to Jannah for it, even in the life of this world. Sometimes there comes a time in your life when you listen to the recitation of the Qur'an and it moves you. And sometimes you listen to the same recitation but it doesn't move you. Yes? Sometimes you listen to a lecture and you feel inspired. And another person sitting in the same gathering listens to that lecture and he's not inspired. Yes. Sometimes you listen to dua and tears flow from your eyes. Sometimes you listen to the same dua a week later, a month later, and tears don't flow from your eyes. There could be different reasons for it. But one of the reasons is when the, e uh, sorry, when the ears are strengthened, when the ears are kept tahir, when the ears are kept away from haram and najasa, those ears appreciate the call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when those ears are made dirty with haram, then the very same ears cannot appreciate the recitation of the Qur'an, the recitation of dua. The very same ear is not inspired by a hadith or by the words of the Holy Prophet. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. <coughs> Let us take our hearts to <coughs> the city of Medina and do tawassul to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the sake of Lady Fatima that may we find purity in our lives purity in our hearts purity in our limbs through which we can derive iman and good akhlaq. Join me in calling out to Lady Fatima. <coughs> ya Fatima al-Zahra, Ya bint Muhammad, Ayyatuha al-Batul, Ya qurrata ayn al-Rasul, Ya sayyidatana wa mawlatana, إنا توجهنا واستشفعنا وتوسلنا بك إلى الله وقدمناك بين يدي حاجاتنا يا وجيهة عند الله اشفعي لنا One more time Ya Waji Ishfa'i lana The door of Ali and Fatima <coughs> was a very special door. It was the door of Rahma. It was the door of Barakah. Every sail would come and knock at this door. The orphan would get something from this door. The captive would get something from this door. The poor person would get something from this door. Students would come to this door and learn about their deen. The door of Ali and Fatima was a very special door. All of the doors were closed that opened into the masjid except for two doors the door of the Holy Prophet and the door of Ali and Fatima. Even towards the end of the Prophet's life, the Prophet of Allah was in the house of Lady Fatima and he was lying on the bed and somebody would come and knock at the door and Lady Fatima would say to him that, O oh, so and so, my father is sick. He is not able to see visitors right now. And that person would go away. And he came back the second time, and he came back the third time. 
When he came back the third time, the Prophet of Allah said to Lady Fatima, O oh Fatima, this person does not knock at any door. He never asks for permission to enter any house. But this is your house, O oh Fatima. This is the only house where he knocks and he asks permission to enter. Ya Rasulullah, after you passed away, some people came to the door of Fatima and they stood around the door of Fatima and they carried swords with them and they carried fire with them and they made a lot of noise outside the door. Lady Fatima came and stood behind that door. She said to them, what are you going to do? They said, we're going to put fire to your house. We're going to break down your door. She said to them, do you not know which door this is? Do you not know whose door this is? They say to her, we know whose door this is. She say to them, this is the door of Fatima. Fatima, the daughter of Rasulullah. They say to her, it doesn't matter whose door it is. We're going to put fire to it. Can you imagine that moment when they put fire to that door, when they broke open? that door can you imagine that door of rahma and baraka can you imagine that door being pushed on lady fatima and she was between the door and the wall can you imagine they dragged amir al mu'mineen out of that door it was so difficult lady fatima would later call out صبت علي مصائب لو أنها صبت على الأيايا مصرنا ليالي What difficulties befell me Had they fallen on the day They would have turned them into the night But oh baby, oh lady Fatima The way they brought fire to your house on the day of Ashura after the martyrdom of Hussein they also brought fire to the tent they put the tents on fire the children were running from one place to another the ladies ran out of the tent and the way you called out to Rasulullah when Zainab ran out of the tent she saw the head of Al Hussein, she saw it on a spear, so she called out to Rasulullah, Wa Muhammad, Salla alayka Malik al Sama, Aza Husseinun, Murammalum biddima, this is your Hussein, he is covered in his own blood, Muqatta'al Aza, his lips. Limbs have been severed, and Ya Rasulullah, wa banatuka sabaya, and your daughters have been taken. Wa sa'alamu al-ladheen zalamu, ala Muhammadin, ayya munqalabiyyan qalibun, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi iraji'un. Oh Allah, we pray to you for the sake of Lady Fatima, for the sake of the Qur'an and the Ahlul Bayt. Oh Allah, we pray to you to accept our tears for the Ahlul Bayt. Oh Allah, we pray to you to accept all of our good deeds and to forgive our sins. Oh Allah, we pray to you to answer our hajat. Oh Allah, we pray to you for those who are sick and suffering. Ya Allah, we pray to you to grant them strength and give them a complete and a quick recovery. O oh Allah, we pray to you for our marhumin, to shower them with your rahmah and your maghfirah. O oh Allah, we pray to you for those who are suffering around the world. 
especially those who are suffering from tyranny and oppression. O oh Allah, we pray to you to return peace and justice back to their lands. O oh Allah, we pray to you to hasten the reappearance of the 12th Imam. Ya Hussain. Ya Hussain.